for coming today and it's a great pleasure to come along and talk to you a little bit about UK where um, the kind of research that we're doing. Um, I'm going to talk about three things today. Um, the first is just describing what UK where does, how we're set up, how we're structured and so on. Then a little bit about innovation in the water industry. As you probably know, the water industry gets a lot of bad press about not being innovative for all kinds of reasons. So I'll just talk a little bit about that in industry. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about the um, source apportionment tool, which is one of the um, pieces of research that we've, we've led on that's helped uh, mitigate some of the uh, more complicated European legislative requirements um, and make sure we can handle those and meet the required requirements in the most cost-effective and risk-free way or risk-managed way. So a bit about me first. Um, as you can see from my name, I'm Scan I was originally Scandinavian. I'm actually from Cornwall, so not too far from here. So I know the area very well, and it's always good to come back down to, uh, this way. So that, that's really good to come here. Um, I started off as a geologist, um, and then a hydrogeologist, and then I moved into material science, working mostly on metallurgy um, in the North Sea. Um, and then I joined the power industry in 1987, a long time ago. Um, well, I worked for about twen over 20 years, um, doing a whole range of different things. Um, I finished off uh, working um, on a power station and uh, mainly uh, head of environment for RWE, which you may have heard of, which owns NPower, and that's one of the companies it owns in the UK. Um, so I was head of uh, environment, and then I was head of research and development and innovation in RWE as well. So I've done quite a lo lot, lot of different interesting things in my career. So as I said, I'll talk co about quite a few things here. But if you want to ask any questions, just interrupt me as I go along. And I'll be more than happy to do that. And I'll probably start asking you some questions as well, just to liven things up a bit. OK, so UK Weir, um, United Kingdom Water Industry Research. Um, so we're a fairly small organisation that was set up by the big water companies. Um, there's 23 altogether at the moment. So these water and sewage companies and the water only companies in the UK. So that includes Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales as well as England. Um, and they each own uh, a proportion of the company and they fund the research. So each uh, water company puts money into the uh, queer budget and then we uh, manage the research agenda on their behalf. Um, so the local one here, um, South West Water, puts a proportion of funding into our account, if you like, and we manage that and conduct research on their behalf. So what we do is actually single voice research on behalf of the water um, industry. So we have a fairly um, democratic system where everybody gets together and decides what the key um, strategic issues or what the short term issues are as well and the kind of research that we want to do. Most of it is fairly short term, I have to say. It's mostly uh, one year projects, that kind of thing, although we do do some longer term strategic research as well. Um, so the second there, shaping and leading the future research agendas. This is something I, I spend a lot of my time doing, is going talking to the research councils, for example, going to Europe a lot, uh, talking to water companies overseas as well about uh, the research agenda that they're following. And if there's any way we can collaborate and work together and uh, try and make sure that we're researching the right kind of things um, and not you know, spending a bit less time on some of the things that aren't really that important anymore. Um, so that, that's quite a big part of, of my personal role. Um, so, as I said, the water companies get together with other collaborators and we participate and steer projects. So, at the moment, we have about 65 projects going at one time. Um, the other collaborators are universities, such as yourselves, um, the research councils, but also the regulators. So, Ofwat, which is the main economic regulator for the water industry, works with us, along with CC Water, Communicant. Um, Consumer Council for Water, sorry, thank you there. <laughs> yeah, for, for water. So they work with us on uh, customer issues um, and other collaborators as well, DEFRA, the Environment Agency, and so on. Um, so they're robust and reliable evidence. So we're really about doing science and engineering research. That's most of what we do. Um, we do some research on uh, interaction with customers, so understanding what best practice looks like for uh, um, how water companies can interact with customers. Because as you know, one of the big parts in the regulatory system here is that the water companies have to engage with their customers to make sure they understand what, what's important to customers and what isn't and where um, investment should be directed, and what sorts of things customers are, are interested in. So has anybody here had any uh, engagement with water companies in these, these types of things? OK. What kind of, th what kind of things... Uh, that's you, Zorin. What, what kind of things have you done... Okay, yeah. Asset management, yeah. Water management, yeah. Water management, yeah. 
about security lately it was the development of early warning system for bird detection. Okay. So Quarter range then, yeah. Did you put your hand? I think you did. <laughs> what kind of things have you done? Um, well, we work, well, three of us work for water testing. Okay. So Which one do you work for? Water. Okay, wash water, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I work on treatment like so quite right. a lot of Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Gentleman up there. Yeah, I worked on a an aquarium project um, looking at urban flooding and uh, trying using artificial neural networks to okay. predict urban flooding and looking at the possibility of using that to uh, do real time control of uh, things like sluices and uh, pumps. All oh, right. Right. Okay. No, good. So quite a, quite a range of things anyway. Um, so yeah, the final thing is about sharing best practice, encouraging continuous improvement, that kind of thing. So this is something I'm very keen on with the membership more than anything actually, is to get them to share ideas and information so they can learn from each other um, and try and move things forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's, innovation, it's, it's a very hindrance yeah. Melter. It's a very it's a it's a very interesting subject that. Um, as you probably know, in the water bill that's just going through now, um, the aim is that by 2017 that um, industrial customers will be competing, or the water companies will be competing for industrial customers, um, which is a big change to what we've had before. And so, that, as you rightly say, there's there's a bit of an issue about whether. Um, companies would really want to share information because of the competitive na nature of that part of the market. Um, this is where sort of my background comes in a bit because I, I used to work, as, as I said, for the, for the um, power industry, which is cutthroat competition big time, not, not just in the um, retail customer side of it, which is the bit you'll be familiar with, with um, E.ON and N-Power and SSE and all the rest of it, which at the moment is getting very bad press for all kinds of reasons. Um, the bit I worked in was um, the, power, the um, power stations, which also competed in a, in a big way. The big thing about the thing that I learned from that is, um, although some things um, you can't do because it encroaches onto um, things that are commercially sensitive, there is actually a lot of research that still goes on because there's still a lot of common voice issues that aren't in the commercial arena. So environmental research is a very good example of that. So working with the Environment Agency, for example, um, to look at how um, um, legislation can be interpreted and what kind of research is needed to support how the regulator might regulate the industry. So despite what you think, even in a, um, a fairly competitive market, you do get a lot of common voice research going on. It just isn't the same kind of research that would be going on if there were no competition. So it's a very good, very good point, but um, it doesn't mean that you know, we'll, we'll stop doing research. I'm, I'm sure we'll continue. But any, anything to do with um, something that might give one company a competitive advantage over another is something that you know, they'd be less interested in supporting. Um, so that's, but, but as I said, that's a very interesting question. Um, right, a bit about innovation now. Um, one, one of my roles in RWE, um, which is a big company, about 180,000 people in Germany, UK, Netherlands mainly, Spain, um, was looking after innovation for part of the, the company. Um, and we hear a lot about innovation, so I'll just sort of fire that out to you as well. Do you, any, do you know what you, what kind of things do you think innovation is about? Because obviously this is something that's important to the university here. So any, any idea? I've, I've written some things down there which I'll whip through in a minute, but has anybody got any comments on what innovation is or isn't? Come on, folks. <laughs> So it can be academic, can be industrial, can be different different types of things. Then. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. New ideas. Yeah. Improvement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? What is not mentioned? So if you had a Venn diagram, you had of invention and innovation, and they don't necessarily cross over. Do you mean? Some commonality, but not. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Any other ideas? Well, I, I actually think in innovation, um, if you go to the, you know, such as Welsh Water and the power industry as well and the petrochemical industry, oil companies, etc., the one thing they're looking for in their um, employees is innovation. Is, that's a key part of what you do. It's just part of the job. 
Now, I've talked a bit about um, continuous improvement, but it's, it's actually about being enthusiastic about challenging what you do um, and not necessarily taking what the manager says as, as a gospel and uh, challenging the, you know, the way you organise things. It's not just about technical things, you know, the way you run your water treatment plant or you look for leakages or whatever. Um, it's also about the way you conduct your business as well, um, is, is the business running in an optimal way. So I, I think an innovate, innovative company or an innovative in institution such as here is really about people challenging the status quo and not being afraid to say, you know, there's a better way of doing this, or, you know, is, is this the right way of doing things? It might well be. Um, but here's some ideas about how to make that improve. Um, the, the other thing, of course, about innovation is most of it fails because some of it doesn't work, some of it's too risky or too expensive, or the, it's, the timing's not right, et cetera. So it's, it's quite a complicated business. But for me, it's, it's about people being enthusiastic about what they're doing and wanting to improve what they do, and also share information openly as well. So I've just, just listed a few things there. Successful implementation of new ideas, well, sometimes it is. Um, as I said, often it doesn't really work very well. Um, but that, that's part of it. It's about dreaming up new ways of doing things. And that's where some diversity in companies is very, very helpful as well. If you have people with lots of different experiences um, and ways of approaching things, getting that working together and bouncing ideas off each other actually could produces a lot of innovative thinking. Dynamic value of driven change, anybody any idea what that means? I think what I mean there is it's just about something, you don't just change things for no reason, you change things to improve things, to make, make more money if that's what you're about, or to improve the reliability of equipment, or change the way you run equipment, etc. Um, exploiting full potential of new perspectives, so that, that's just about looking at things in a very different way. So if you get an economist in to look at a particular system, you get an engineer in to look at a system, or you get a, 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 social, um, a social scientist in to look at a particular system, they'll look at it in a very, very different way, and they'll each come up with different ways of improvement. So again, having, having that interaction is very, very important. So as I said, new technologies, which is a big part of what the universities do, looking for new ways or new technologies to um, move things forward. Doing things differently, adopting better practice, so learning from others. Um, even when there is competition, you still learn from other companies. That's, that's a big part of what it's about. Um, entrepreneurship, you know, endowing resources to create wealth, really. That's a big part of, of um, commercial companies, is about doing things that makes more money or reduces risk or reduces cost, etc. Um, I've also listed a whole load of other names that you may come across. So open innovation, dynamic, facilitative, explorative, there's a whole range of these names, but it all means the same thing for me. It's just about being enthusiastic about changing things for the better, I think is really what innovation's about. And that's a big part of what a university is about as well, in my, in my view. Um, and hopefully that's the, the reason you're all here. So what does it look like? Um, so it's translating an idea or an invention into something of value, I think is the big thing. Um, Again, what's value doesn't necessarily mean more money um, or more cash generation. It can mean avoiding risk, avoiding cost, better ways of managing things, etc. Um, I think also about managing change and continuous improvement. So le leading change is actually the, the thing there rather than just managing change. Um, and then finally, it's about creating and maintaining excitement and a buzz. You can always see this when you come into a... Because I do a lot of work with other um, industries and other companies. You can, you can sort of feel it. As soon as you get in there, people are you know, jumping around doing stuff. There's whiteboards with all kinds of ideas. And there's you know, people excited, you know, very interested in you know, why they're there. And they're, they're trying to change things and make things happen. So I think that, that's, that, that kind of thing is very difficult to um, define. But I th when you experience it, you, you know what I mean. So if you go off to, um, I don't know, Silicon Valley in the States, for example, which I've, had the, I've been fortunate to do, and you go into some of these places where they're you know, developing these, these new gadgets and applications, it's fantastic. You can see all this going on. Now, that kind of environment is actually very, very easy to do innovative things when you're doing sort of IT gadgets. Um, when, you're doing, you, when you've got big bits of engineering kit, it's a lot more difficult, a lot slower. Um, but the same kind of principle um, is, is in place, I think. So, moving on, um, how does innovation happen? Um, what, what I've done here is to just um, try and distill how it all happens in my brain anyway and try and get it onto a, a piece of uh, a slide just, just to give you an idea what actually happens in a company. Um, as I said, it's part of the job, um, and it is part of the job. Even people who, you know, whose, whose main job isn't a very high-level technical job, it's innovation is still part of what they do, and that's a big part of it. Um, 
So I said, I call the internal processes or melting pot. I mean, sometimes it's uh, meetings where people get together and talk about stuff. Sometimes it's things on a computer system. Sometimes it's just what's in people's heads and conversations that go on. Because after all, a company really at the end of the day is just people having conversations, in my view. Which you may or may not agree with, but I, th I think it is. Just, just going around looking at companies, looking at what they do, it's actually just people talking to each other is 90% of what a company is. Anyway, um, sharing, so despite what you may hear about knowledge is power and that kind of thing, which it is in a way, um, to actually make innovation work and make companies successful and people successful is they've got to share ideas. You've got to talk about stuff to other people who don't know about what you're talking and engage them and get some conversations going. Um, and that's a big, big part of innovation. Without that, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't work. Handling paradoxes. Um, some companies say we're fully forward-looking, we're innovative, uh, but you're not allowed to take any risks, and you're not allowed to spend any money. So there's a automatically there, you've got something which just doesn't work or gel. You can't be innovative without taking risks. You have to take risks, and you have to spend money, and you have to realize that a lot of that won't work, and you'll waste a lot of what you do. Um, and that's just the nature of it. So you must accept that before you move into this kind of environment. Um, Recognise and overcome barriers. Um, sometimes they can be technical barriers, so you're trying to develop a new technology to take bugs out of a water, wastewater treatment plant or something like that, and it just doesn't work. It isn't going to work unless you do something else. Um, sometimes the barrier might be people. It might be your manager isn't going to support what you're doing, and you have to think about other strategies to make things work. Um, and again, of, often it's about challenging in a constructive way. Um, Many, many companies um, actually do invest a lot in innovation, although it's, it's difficult to, it's not actually put on their um, P&L account or balance sheet, but they do spend a lot of money on innovation. Um, it's just um, done in a different way. But in order to secure that funding, you've got to challenge and uh, get people confident so that what you're doing is the right thing for the organisation. Um, so overcoming those barriers are, are important. And innovative people don't take no for an answer either. I've done this loads of time. I go to my manager, ask for some money to do something and they won't, you know, they won't do it. Well, you just got to find out the kind of things they're interested in, what's going to make them interested in supporting the project you've got in mind and make that happen. So it takes a lot of perseverance as well. But I, I think 99% you know, of people who believe in something are perseverant are, you know, and will keep working at it until it works and uh, comes to fruition. Uh, comfortable stakeholders. Um, yeah, this is quite an interesting one. Um, there's a whole range of stakeholders in, in an industrial company, as you know, as there are in other institutions, such as this one. Um, it's really just understanding who they all are and what's going to interest them. So some stakeholders, you've got to go and talk to them. Others, you've got to do a talk like this. Others, it's just a simple conversation or a memo or something like that. But it's, it sounds very crass and simplistic. But just drawing a simple table of who your stakeholders are, what are they actually interested in, what gets them... Um, thinking your way, and how can you get the best out of them as well. Um, just doing it that way is a very effective way of, uh, of a, a, attempting that. And finally, um, serious, sorry, serious space time. Um, I'm going to get too Einstein about this, but basically it's about people having enough time and enough space to do, think creatively and make stuff happen. Okay, so all this stuff's going on in a company. Then there's some kind of a filtering process. So I've called it a pipeline or a funnel or a series of gates or a series of hurdles or even intuition, as I've said there. Um, can anybody think what kind of you know, gates and hurdles might be put in place to look at new ideas and uh, innovative practices, etc.? cetera? So funding. Sorry? Funding. funding, yeah. So if I came to you and said, right, I've got this great idea, but it's going to cost 20,000 quid, can you give it to me, please? What would you do? Apart from say yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good business case is very, as you say, is very important. So, again, it's how much, what are you going to spend the money on? How risky is the project? What's the return likely to look like over how long? That kind of stuff. That's very important, yeah? Anybody, any other ideas about what the, the hurdle might be? Yeah, it's how risk averse a company might be. So if I were to compare um, the financial services in, this, in London and a water company, which one do you think is most risk averse? 
well, there's no probably about it. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It depends on the company, as you know, as you say. Some companies. Now, the reason the water industry is is risk averse is for very good reason because of public health. You know, you can't afford to make make a mistake. And all the water companies, it's their number one, to, it's their top priority to secure public health and protect public health. So they have to be risk averse. I think is is probably the reality. So in a risk averse company, it's about understanding the kind of things that you know they might take a risk on. Um, or where they're you know, prepared to be a little bit more um, facilitative, if you like. So it's just understanding that. And a lot of that is just talking to people. As I said, it's just about conversations, understanding you know, people who've got the, the control of funding, etc., the sort of things that they're interested in and where they'd be prepared to, to make an investment or not. Okay, so anyway, there's, there's a whole range of these different, and lots of companies have, very, have lots of complicated processes. The, the last one I was in had a very complicated process. There were about seven or eight gates you had to go through. Each one you had to make a presentation, and gradually, and by the end of the eighth gate, nothing ever got through, so nothing ever happened. So it was a bit of a self-fulfilling uh, <laughs> a a disaster, really. So you've got to have some flexibility in there, but it, it, the, the, the most important thing about this filter is it's not just about filtering out the rubbish, it's actually drawing through the stuff that's going to work, the stuff that you know, might well work well. So it's about encouraging that, that innovative um, activity through the process as well. So it's not just filtering stuff out, it's drawing stuff in. Which sounds great conceptually until you actually see it working, and it's, it's quite exciting when it does. Okay, so once you've done all that, you're then here. So idea or innovation with intrinsic value. So it has to have value. It's got to either make money, reduce risk, reduce cost, um, improve processes, or whatever it is. It must have value. If it doesn't, then you're not going to sell it. Um, and some things can happen, obviously. First is a, a slow and expensive death. So this is where you've probably seen this kind of thing before, where it's sometimes people's hobby horse, you know, they're interested in a particular technology, maybe, and they'll just keep at it. Um, even when they know it's not really going to work very well or it's going to cost too much money. Um, but it's still, it's still a, quite a painful and difficult process, but it, it is part of what happens. Um, you can spend a lot of money on something. Again, another good example is, is a thing called um, Regenesis. Has anybody heard of that before? You probably haven't heard of. Um, a big part, as you know, of the uh, government's um, strategy is a 80% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050. Um, and a big, a big thing that my, uh, one of my previous companies did was develop this technology called Regenesis, which was basically a massive battery. So it was a way of storing large quantities of energy, not little, not a few sort of watts, it was you know, megawatts of energy. So it was an enormous battery system that could be plugged on to uh, renewable generation, basically. Yeah. So photovoltaics or, um, well, wind, wind power would be the other one, obviously. Um, and th this one just was a slow and expensive death because it, it should have worked, but it was just so difficult, the, mostly because of technical problems. Trying to get the kit at the right size, composition, and so on was just an enormous difficulty. Um, you're dealing with complicated chemicals that needed to react in a certain way, and at, sc at the bench scale, it worked pretty well, but at large scale, it just didn't for, for all kinds of reasons I, I won't go into now. But there's always this temptation to keep investing a little bit more, invest a bit more, and just keep going, and, and eventually it'll work. And you know, sometimes you've just got to you know, bite the bullet and say, this isn't ever going to work, or it's just going to be too expensive, so we're going to have to kill it. Um, again, any, any, any ideas about why that might be difficult to, to can, a big project like that? Yeah? Well, as you invest more and more, um, there's more and more to lose, and so you tend to yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like gambling. It's, it, is <laughs> it is a bit like gambling. Yeah, yeah. No, you're dead right. Any, anybody, any ideas or any uh, illustrations of how that's happened in the past with uh, stuff? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People put their reputation, stake their reputations on things, then it's very difficult, especially if they're powerful people, it's difficult. Yeah. Any other examples of you know, maybe technologies? They're, they're quite. Uh, Membrane technologies, very expensive membrane technologies that you know, aren't really working very well. Um, some do very, very well, but it's not, not so there successful. C5. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, no. What do you think the problem was with the C5 then? Does everybody know what that was, by the way? No? It, it was, <laughs> was the very first electrical 
electric cars that was commercially available. Yeah. Uh, I use the term car very loosely. Yeah. It was actually a very successful piece of engineering. It was a small, little small. It looked a bit like a noddy, a noddy car, unfortunately. The, the problem was the, the marketing wasn't right. He hadn't, um, Sinclair hadn't thought about what the customer really wanted. And with a car, it's not just about functionality and cost. It's also about what it looks like. And if it looks dreadful, you, you, know, you don't want to be seen dead in it. Then you know, it's not something people are going to invest in. So that's quite a, quite a good, uh, good example. Now, one, one thing you mentioned there was actually critical for me with this kind of business is you, you've got a lot to lose. Well, actually, you don't have anything to lose. Once you've put money, sunk money into something, that money's gone, and you take the decision and go. Forget about it and move on. You forget about how much money you've spent on something. It's sunk, sunk costs, basically. And you should never use the amount of money you spent on something to, to decide whether to continue with, continue with it or not. That's a really important principle. Um, that I've learned to my cost because I've, you know, been guilty of it as, as many, you know, many of you here have as well. Once you've invested your, your time, effort, you, you know, you believe in something and you've spent money, you don't want to kill it. It's a very difficult decision, but in an innovative company, it's a critical part of, of uh, innovation is to kill stuff that isn't working or isn't good or put something to bed. As I said there, it could work. Um, so, you know. A new technology might work in a new world where costs are higher, uh, where other types of technology have been developed, where the infrastructure is slightly different or whatever. Um, it could work. So it's something you, you just sort of hold back on and don't invest on in the moment. So that's another, another area. But the, you know, the big thing for me is it doesn't matter how much you spent on something. If it's not the right thing, you just have to kill it. Quick death, uh, which is more or less the same thing, really. Something hasn't worked, just kill it. Really important. Uh, it works, yeah. It's, it's, you know, you know, we have this sort of Pareto thing, you know, this 80-20 rule. It's actually more like 90-10 or even, even worse than that, 95-5. But some things do work and make a fortune and uh, are very successful. Um, most stuff doesn't work for all kinds of reasons. But unless you try, um, you don't know, I think, is the, the thing. Any idea how a company might reduce its risks with innovation? Yeah, have a portfolio of different projects, so you, you allocate funding to different projects. Yeah, another uh, um, one thing that uh, another company I worked with years ago was they wanted to be first at being second, so they allowed other companies to do the really difficult stuff. And once they've proven the technology or an approach works, they then cotton onto it and make use of it. It's not always it's not always best to be first at something. I think so. It's it's a very um, it's a very valid way to um, mitigate your risk is to allow someone else to take the big risks and you follow on afterwards. You may not make as much money or be successful as the, the person who pioneered a particular technology, but um, it's still got value and worth. Um, so, you know, you know, that may work as well. Anyway, and uh, it doesn't work, but we learned that one. Um, and again, I, I always like to think with innovation, research and development, you never fail, really, do you? You, don't, you never really fail. It may not work. It didn't work the way you wanted, or it's too expensive or whatever, but you never fail because you've learned. You've learned that's not the way to do it. And out of it, something else you know, fortuitously, fortuitously came out and uh, has been you know, made use of. So actually doing the research um, cr does create value even when you fail which again is a very difficult uh, concept to accept. But I think innovative people don't care. You know, they're not interested in things fail or not. They just go on to the next thing. So you've got to be prepared to accept failure, I think. Um, actually, my, in my experience, um, in, uh, universities are much better at that kind of stuff than industry is, interestingly. Anyway, is that uh, helpful? Any questions on that lot? Yeah. You mean the innovation dying itself, or you mean you put a stop on it because it's not working? Yeah. Do you mean transitively or intransitively? I've, I've, I, what I mean there is it's, it's killed itself. It's just not working on itself. The quick death is the, you know, the chop. You sort of, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's more or less the same kind of thing. Um, if something isn't working, you know, the, the project manager or the senior manager has to take the decision to stop, stop funding and uh, kill the project. Very difficult decision to make. OK. Um, moving on then. What I thought I'd do is just go through one of um, a quiz 
um, projects um, and just give you a flavour of the kind of things that we do. Before I do that, though, I just want to talk a little bit about the range of research that UK Weir does, just, just for interest, really. Um, the way we're set up is we, we have a very small team based in London, um, and I employ between 15 and 20 project managers who are part-time people who actually run the projects for the company. Um, we also have people called client managers who are technical specialists who reside in, each, in most of the water companies, and they all are responsible for a particular area of research. Um, so down here, for example, my, my colleague in Southwest Waters uh, looks after um, water resources, so supply and demand uh, resources, that kind of thing. So the kind of areas that we look at, um, just sort of climate change is one, so understanding you know, is, is it or isn't happening? Is anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases affecting the climate? If so, how much? How might it affect a water company's ability to conduct its business going forward, etc.? So we have one person who looks at that kind of thing. So mitigation, um, adaptation, or suffering, I think is the other, the other uh, way of dealing with that. But anything to do with climate change, we, we look at that. We have probably three or four projects every year looking at that. Um, so another one is regulation. As I said before, we do a lot of collaborative work, as you can see there, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, with the regulators. So we do a lot of research with them. They also part uh, fund what we do, and they uh, work with us on our steering groups, which is the group of people that um, direct the research project um, that some of you may be familiar. So we work very closely with them. Um, Asset management, as you probably be familiar, you know, water companies got lots and lots of assets. Most of them are very, very old and uh, need to be maintained and protected. So we do an awful lot of research on capital investment strategies, that kind of thing. So understanding how assets are behaving, what kind of main maintenance regimes might be an effective way of managing them, where replacement should or shouldn't happen. Um, one interesting area, actually, just this as an aside, that with assets is leakage. Um, you hear a lot about this in the, in the media, you know, particularly when water companies are talking to their uh, customers and their customer en engagement um, processes. That's one of the things that um, customers are always complaining about is, does anybody have any idea how much uh, water is leaks out of the distribution system? As a percentage, anybody got any idea? Sorry? It's not quite that high, no. no. It's about 20, it's just over 20, as an average across the UK. So this is just the distribution, the clean water distribution system. It's about 20%. So as you can understand, you know, we're asking people to you know, use less water, you know, particularly with the, the drought, the two uh, winter drought that we had a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it's a very difficult message to, to tell customers, please be, you know, be careful with water usage. And then they hear, oh, hang on a minute, you're chucking 20% of it away. What are you playing at? You know, it's, it's a bit of a, it is a difficult, uh, difficult thing to communicate. Um, have any of you heard of the economic level of leakage? Which is a, this is basically something that the regulator um, uses to assess leakage and to set leakage reduction targets. Because um, as, as you probably know, uh, finding and repairing leaks is a very difficult and expensive business. Um, so it's just um, balancing the cost of leakage repair against the amount of, or the value of the water that's lost. Again, quite a, quite a difficult thing. But it is, it is something we spend a lot of time researching in. And we've got a, a client manager um, who specializes in leakage. So understanding how leakage, you know, some of the fundamental uh, leakage well, reasons for leakage taking place in the first place, where it might happen, what kind of you know, pipe work might cause leakage. Is it the pipes itself, degradation of pipes, or is it connections and all this kind of stuff? So we do quite a lot of research into that. Um, it's mostly technical research, but again, it's, it's a, an important area. So that's leakage. Um, drinking water, so we work with the DWI, the Drinking Water Inspectorate, on looking forward um, to understand what kind of things might be appearing in the future and what sort of research we should be doing now to better understand those issues. Um, so it might be viruses or pathogens or it could be anything in drinking water. The other thing is usually nickel and lead, those so heavy metals that may inadvertently appear in drinking water. So it's just understanding how it gets there, how it can be mitigated, what effect it is on public health and that kind of thing. Okay, uh, asset management, bio uh, waste management, so biosolids, what can be done about that? Yeah, sure, yeah, of course. Yeah. Into the, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Interesting as you say that, we've just done a project on that, although we haven't published it yet. Um, although it's um, really an assessment of what we know out there already, it's not fundamental research. So we haven't sort of dug any holes or set any explosions off and this kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting area. And obviously, the water companies are very keen to make sure their aquifers are protected um, if you know, fracking takes place and what sort of degree of fracking takes place. Um, the kind of places that it, it's um, where it's likely to be beneficial or you know fruitful for a fracking company would be Morecambe Bay, Northern Ireland, and the South, underneath the South Downs. Basically, that's where there's likely to be the most or easily extractable extractable um, shale gas. But yeah, it's a very difficult, complicated area. Um, some research has gone in the states, as you know, but their geology is completely different to the UK. It's great expanses of sedimentary rocks, um, so it's technically a, a less complicated process than here is my understanding. Uh, but yeah, we, we certainly do look at that. Again, the difficulty that it does become a bit more, you know, it's quite a political issue as well, which is something I'm keen UCWI doesn't get involved with. We're not here to deal with politics. We're actually here just to do fundamental science so that the policy makers can look at that and make, you know, some sensible calls based on that. But yeah, good, good question. Okay, anybody, any idea? Ran here then, how much water is from rivers or is extracted from aquifers or any other? Uh... Is Sorry? Is all of it is what? Rivers. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, mostly reservoirs, yeah, yeah. But as you know, it, it, it does depend on which part of the country you're at. A lot, some, some parts of the country, a lot of it is from aquifers, so protecting aquifers is a really important issue. Whereas, you know, around here and in Scotland and Wales, it's perhaps less, less of an issue. Um, just depends how much it rains and what the, un, you know, the fundamental geology is and that kind of thing. But again, that, that's a big part of the research that we do. Um, as you probably know, as, as I mentioned before, the drought that um, appeared um, a couple of years ago, um, it did get very, very serious where the, the, the aquifer, um, the spring, the ground level was really dropping quite significantly in some parts of the country. So really understanding why that happens, how much rainfall might trigger out off, all that kind of stuff. So we'd be doing research on that as well, just to try and um, use uh, climatology as a predictive tool to determine how much how it might affect the, um, the aquifers and groundwater levels. OK, so that's that. Uh, customers, big area of research now. Didn't used to be. We hardly did any work on customers before, but now we are. We're doing a lot of work on customer engagement, levels of debt. As you know, you can't be cut off if you don't pay your water bill. So a large proportion or a significant proportion of everybody's bills is actually paying for people who aren't paying their bills. So what level should that be? Is it fair? Is it not fair? Should we have social tariffs? That kind of stuff. It's quite an important um, issue. Uh, you, well, not a lot. <laughs> it, well, it depends where you are, and depend it depends where you are. And, you know, there's all fundamentally, you can't be disconnected as you would be with gas or electricity. So that that's the big difference. But understanding why that happens, why people are less inclined to pay bills, etc., than others. Another thing is the structure of the company as well. For example, our colleagues here at Welsh Water, you're you're a kind of public organisation, aren't you? You're not a private company. That's right. So somewhere like Seven Trent or Yorkshire or you know Southwest Water, a private company is here to make money. Um, so there's there's that issue as well um, that's that can be difficult. Okay, so that's customer research. Um, what else have we got? The other two big areas. One is wastewater, obviously. So understanding how wastewater treatment plant works or doesn't work. What kind of nasties can be removed using what technology? Uh, the Water Framework Directive is a big issue, as I'm sure you're aware. How should that be implemented or interpreted by legislation? How much money should you spend on what cleaning up what issues at what locations, that kind of stuff, which I'll talk a bit about now, um, is, is a, a really important issue. Biosolids is another one, so um, sludge from wastewater treatment plant. What can you do with that? Should you stick it on the land? Should you make gas out of it or use it to produce other you know, positive... Uh, Byproducts. Is it a waste? Is it not a waste? These these kind of debates as well. We we spend quite a lot of time working on. Uh, I guess the other area is uh, this sort of stuff. So um, chemicals and nasties out in the environment, winding up in the water system. Who's actually accountable for removing that? Who should pay for it? How should that be managed? And this is really one of the projects that we we're working on here at Uckwear. 
Um, so source apportionment, um, really what it's about is assessing the origin of waterborne substances, accounting for substances, so knowing what is coming from where, how much, um, describing them, delineating them, that sort of thing. Quantifying cost and benefit measures. I mean, if you've got enough money, you can remove almost anything from anything, really, can't you, if you work hard at it. It's just how much should you spend on what substances, who should pay for it, what's an acceptable level of removal, that kind of thing. Better understanding. So even now, we're not that clear um, about what's coming from where, what, what the sources of uh, various nasties are. Um, and then better management. So really, that's what it's all about. That's, that's the, you know, the important thing for the water industry, the water companies, the regulators, and the customers to make sure it's managed as effectively as we can. So we're spending the right amount of money on the right technology and techniques in the right places to benefit everybody. Uh, as I said, a collaboration. So this is quite a nice project. We're UK Weir, and 11 of the water companies separately as well have put um, expertise and funding um, or in-kind in help and advice into this project as well. Um, Environment Agency, SEPA, the Scottish version, uh, the Welsh version, version as well. Um, off what DEFRA, Natural England, <coughs> CC Water and the RSPB. And these are the organisations that have worked with us as well, done most of the work. So as you can see, uh, your colleagues down at Plymouth are involved, but you actually weren't on this one, although you have done work with the UK were before, as you know. So quite a range of uh, people there have been involved in this project, and it's quite a, quite a big project. Um, So, quantifying sources at a range of scales for a range of substances. So essentially, um, it's dividing the country up into geographical reasons, re regions. Uh, there's lots of ways of doing this, but this is just the way we decided to do it. And then where does all this stuff come from? Is it from water treatment plants? Is it from other sources? There's a whole range of sources, as you can see. Um, how much of which substance comes from which source is the, really the thing we're looking at here. So what might be needed to meet the water framework uh, reg related targets? Does everybody know what the water framework directive is, by the way? Anybody not know what it is? It's a piece of European legislation which aims to protect the aqueous environment or the environment generally. Um, and it defines a certain number of substances and talks about what is a safe or sensible level or concentration of various substances in the aqueous environment. Um, to protect the environment and to protect human health. So it's a set of standards that the European Union has um, engaged with uh, various scientific and research institutions and come up with some numbers. Okay, so there's going to be a requirement for a fair redu reduction in uh, substances. Um, so are the reductions proportional to pollution sources? That's something we don't really understand as well as we might. Can it be achieved? The kind of things that we're interested in, as I said, the nitrogen phosphorus, metals, biocides, etc. Um, but all kinds of different substances are covered by the legislation. Um, and it's essentially a geographical um, GIS system um, where we look at various possible sources of uh, substances. So discharges from uh, water organisations, equipment, and etc. Also from agriculture. As you know, a lot of work, a lot of good work's been done here on catchment management and upstream thinking at Southwest Water and Wessex Water as well, and up in the north of England as well. This is essentially trying to educate land users and land owners to do things in a slightly different way to reduce the amount of um, deleterious substances getting into the water courses. Um, so it's, it's just a way of improving um, substances at source, so we have to spend less money on treating uh, water once it gets to a water treatment plant. So a range of other sources as well, storm water, non-rains, uh, urban runoff, highway runoff, mines, atmospheric, general background, etc. Um, SimCat is a uh, well-established model used by the Environment Agency. Um, to model how these substances get together, how they work. And then the outputs are, of course, what sort of limits should be, are sensible and achievable. So, as I said there, it integrates uh, data from point and diff um, diffuse sources with uh, the SimCat water simulation model. Integrates river water quality and lake simulation, so to take account of all the dynamic in, um, interactions in the environment that I'm sure you're all more aware of than I am, but quite a complicated business, all these different sources of water, how it moves about, what the characteristics of various sources might be, that kind of thing. 
Um, quantifying pollutants, so pollutant loads into lakes, rivers, and coastal waters. Um, so it operates, as I said, with a GIS interface to produce visual outputs, um, and you can incorporate external data as well. So get all this data into an all-encompassing model and see what's actually happening. Um, you can also do some testing, some what-if testing. What if it re reduced that? What would it do? What would it look like? What effect would it have on the receiving medium? That kind of thing. Um, again, understanding what the costs of removing certain substances might be, what, what's the positive effect on the environment, and then having some kind of correlation between the two. And that's uh, just another diagram to show what, what's, um, what we've been doing there. Um, it's a fairly new um, system that's been developed over the last couple of years, replacing the, the old system that the agency used. The key thing with this, though, is that we've worked with the regulator to agree a sensible um, approach to looking at this. It's not about protecting the interests of the water companies, although it is indirectly. It's just about getting the best possible deal for the environment and uh, customers and the and industry um, to remove the right su um, substances in the right place at the right cost. And that was all I was going to say. So I've been talking for about 50 minutes or so. So hopefully you found that interesting. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Well, if you've got any questions about electricity as well, and uh, sources of uh, generation sources of electricity, I'm more than happy to talk about that as well. So thanks very much for your attention. Hope you've found that of use. <laughs>